Question on any of the GI stuff from yesterday or any kidney stuff? Everyone's, all right, fantastic. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about reproductive physiology. I mentioned this is when things really get awkward, and so uh, I often deal with, deal with awkward subjects with uh, poor attempts at humor, so get ready for that. <laughs> all right. Uh, main objective, just discuss reproductive physiology. You'll notice, it's funny because you always hear like med uh, medical students and stuff like that say, like, man, we had like two days on like guy stuff and then like, you know, a whole month on, on female stuff. And you'll probably see the same thing kind of here. Um, guys are pretty simple, straightforward. This, uh, ladies, they get very, very complicated, as we'll find out. I still barely understand how women work. Um, again, like I said, I'm, I'm still surprised I'm married at this point. But. Anyhow, uh, we'll look at the endocrine regulation here. Uh, we'll kind of discuss separately the, the male and female physiology and then talk about menstrual cycle and then fertilization, a little bit of uh, development of, of the fetus. All right, so first off, reproduction. You guys are, have heard the birds and the bees talk at least some point in your life, hopefully. Um, obviously, one sperm, one ovum is going to come together. Um, these you know, are considered the, the germ cells, either sperms or ova. We're um, going to be uh, formed within the, the respective male and female gonads uh, via meiosis. We've kind of talked about that kind of early on in the class. We'll, we'll cover that just briefly here again. Um, and then once they're fused, that's when the actual fertilization is occurring, as you know. Uh, and then depending on certain hormonal factors, depending on certain, you know, uh, products that are made during this kind of early uh, development, that's obviously where you're going to have the, the kind of the... Um, and the primary sex organs that are going to be formed there, uh, whether it be the testes in, in the male uh, uh, zygote, or whether it's going to be the ovaries uh, developed there. We'll look at some of the hormonal kind of factors that, that uh, focus on that. And so, um, detail, uh, obviously, you know, uh, who, who kind of determines what the gender of, of the baby is going to be? All right, it's always going to be the male, right? Because guys are going to have the one X and one Y chromosomes, whatever they donate, because um, again, we're donating kind of haploid cells here uh, for the cause. And so, uh, Right, and so, uh, you know, like in my case, like I just happen to be prone to dispense uh, X chromosomes, apparently, because I know I got a second girl in the way. Um, but uh, and, yeah, don't worry, I'm going to use this time to, to pimp my child out. Not literally, but, you know, I'll show some cute pictures. Anyway, um, so, right, so the female is always going to be donating an X chromosome. Male should be just donating either an X or a Y. Obviously, there can be some, some uh, different conditions that occur here, which I won't really get into. You can have like XXY or, you know, different kind of um, abnormalities that can occur there uh, as, a, as a result of kind of um, uh, different factors. Uh, but anywho, um, again, like I mentioned, the, the sex of the child is going to be determined by that contributing sperm in that case. All right, so looking at uh, after the fertilization has occurred, um, you're going to notice that there's kind of a, um, a kind of a neutral kind of pathway that the, the fetus will kind of develop on uh, for a period of time where they really don't have any kind of differentiation between um, their, their type of genitalia that they're forming um, is you know, pretty much identical. So it's kind of in the early, um, notice how these kind of bipotential gonads, meaning that depending on what the kind of um, the influences are as far as like hormones and whatnot, you can uh, kind of... Uh, go either way in some cases, and you know, like the book will talk about, um, you know, animal cases where you can actually have, you know, a, a fetus will have, you know, X and a Y, but if you don't let it have any exposure to testosterone, you won't really develop any of those kind of male um, organs and things like that. So certainly things can go awry here and, and can be affected, uh, but in general, you're going to notice things like, you know, this like testes determining factor uh, will help us decide, okay, well, you know, are we going to actually develop the male organs? Um, and the reason that is is because, you know, things like uh, the the genes that will transcribe for that are always going to be uh, located on the Y chromosome, right? So if that's not available, obviously you won't be developing, or you won't produce that protein, that hormone, you won't be able to, to, to develop those organs. And so things like you know, having these indifferent gonads, um, having the presence of that testes determining factor will then obviously develop the testes versus not having it there, end up having more development of the ovaries. And that will kind of guide you know, which kind of final organs that are developed. Yes, ma'am. So anyway, uh, some other things you can uh, see developing here as well. So looking at uh, kind of the common organs that the, the fetus will be developing and then uh, other influences that can happen here. Um, so for instance, here, this malarian inhib uh, inhibiting uh, factor, uh, if you have this one uh, present, that will actually cause the, the tissue to degenerate here for the male uh, fetus. And versus if you don't have that factor there, that you're lacking the inhibition factor, you're going to develop things like the uterus, the uterine tubes and whatnot, um, versus having presence of testosterone will cause, you know, um, Cause development like epididymis, uh, you know, the ductus differentia, different things like that will kind of, kind of gear you more towards uh, the male development of sex organs versus female. And so, uh, a picture of kind of this development. Um, notice how we have very uh, similar common tissues, uh, and as you start to differentiate, you notice how uh, the development between the, the male. Uh, 
patient versus the female are going to kind of develop here. And notice a lot of the tissues are all the same, just the way they develop. So maybe guys and girls are not so different in the end. <laughs> just kidding, we're very different. <laughs> Anyway, so getting into the actual endocrine <laughs> regulation, um, what do you think are some of the main kind of um, hormones that are going to be influencing regulation of things like sex hormones? So we'll talk about estrogen. What will stimulate estrogen? Follicle stimulating hormone. What's the other big one? Luteinizing hormone. Good. So, and then for the male patient, what's going to stimulate testosterone production? Follicle stimulating hormone. Luteinizing, all right, so you're going to see those are going to be you know, similar pathways there, um, and we're going to look at similar uh, negative feedback loops. So we covered this a little bit uh, kind of in the first section of the class, but we'll kind of cover this again briefly here. So um, obviously a lot of this is going to be regulated through uh, the pituitary, so you're going to have the, the anterior lobe is going to be releasing things um, like your prolactin. We'll talk about this in regards to um, uh, breastfeeding uh, when we get towards uh, the end of the lecture here. Um, but this is also where you're going to have a lot of your follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone that will both have influences on development of uh, and so the secondary sex organs, uh, you know, development at puberty, uh, and that will influence these uh, secretion of things like testosterone, estrogens, and progestins. Those are going to be the main kind of um, different uh, hormones that we're going to be talking about from, from that standpoint. And then obviously from the, the posterior pituitary, you mentioned the um, ADH secretion, we already talked about the kidneys to death already, uh, but that will be secreted there from the posterior. But oxytocin will be the other big uh, hormone. We, we said oxytocin is important for what? Hmm? Uh, yeah, so partially for lactation, uh, before you get to lactation, child, the actual childbirth, right? So actual labor and causing the contraction of the uterus and all that will be um, managed that oxytocin. So um, we'll talk about those more in detail as we get to the individual um, male and female uh, anatomies. Um, so obviously, uh, what stimulates follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone? What's coming from the hypothalamus? Yeah, GNRH is... Uh, uh, not guns and roses hormone, but uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Um, so basically, the, the FSH and LSH are going to be the primary things that get produced from uh, the stimulation of GNRH, uh, and that's going to help us to either develop the spermatogenesis or this oogenesis, uh, so you know, development of sperm or uh, the uh, ova, uh, respectively. It also helps to stimulate that gonadal hormonal secretion, and then just kind of maintains the structure of the gonad. So if you were to have um, you know, say if you were to eliminate the pituitary gland out of a patient, um, say like before puberty, what would happen to that patient, do you think? <laughs> They'd really never have development of a lot of those uh, those kind of secondary characteristics. You know, um, they end up basically having, uh, you know, if you don't su uh, supplement those kind of hormones uh, by giving them uh, what they need, like they're eventually you just won't develop really puberty in, in a lot of cases. Um, so we call those, uh, those patients eunuch or eunuchism. So um, that will kind of develop there. So if you ever watch Game of Thrones? You talk about the eunuch on that one, so uh, he's probably not the most representative uh, eunuch I've ever seen. He probably had puberty at some point in his life, but um, we'll just mention that, that, you know, you really need those, those hormones present in order to cause, you know, development of the secondary sex characteristics, um, and if you're lacking that, then obviously we run into some problems there. Okay, so you mentioned that uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone is really important here. Notice how um, that the GnRH is going to have this kind of pulsatile nature here where you're not going to necessarily really be releasing a kind of a basal amount all the time um, but you should have kind of spikes and in, in, uh, you know, peaks and valleys and as far as release there what's kind of interesting is that um, they're mentioning that you really need that pulsatile nature there for the, the whole system to work they're mentioning that in certain experiments they would give a continuous infusion of GnRH and they would actually find that um, there really was no stimulation of luteinizing hormone or follicle stimulating hormone they're not really sure why what the, the reason is um, but it's just one of those things we kind of noticed that that's just the there's a reason why our body does that we just may not know it and again, um, all this is going to be reg regulated by that negative feedback loop. So if you have, um, once you have enough follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, that can feed back and shut down production of GnRH. Um, similarly, once we have stimulation of either testosterone or the estrogens, or progestins, and also we'll talk about another hormone called inhibin, um, that will also be able to feed back and have effects on, either on the actual pituitary in inhibiting FSH and LH, or it'll also feed back to and inhibit GnRH, right? So again, this is one of those things where you can kind of figure out where the issue is if you were to see, okay, well, is it a hypothalamus issue? You know, are we not producing enough GnRH? You know, what would that cause? You know, what would that cause the FSH and LH levels to be? Should be low, right? Because you never had that stimulation and thus, you know, your estrogen, testosterone should also be low versus if I had a high GnRH level um, versus FSH, low FSH and LH. Be a problem probably with the with the pituitary, right? So those are things you can kind of use. Uh, and so for those patients, 
you know, for, um, like I mentioned, uh, volunteering at the school for the deaf and blind, a lot of those kids end up becoming blind um, due to uh, brain tumors and things like that, where they might have had to have either pituitary uh, resected or a part of the hypothalamus. And so they would often have to be on GnRH replacements or they would be on, um, you know, trying to uh, trying to replace some of these hormones they were not able to produce in the, themselves. And a lot of it is because they either didn't have the stimulating factors here um, in order for that to occur, right? Okay, so first off, we'll talk about male reproductive system. I thought this was a very funny cartoon. I'll leave it at that. Um, so the androgens are going to be the primary um, hormone that uh, guys are going to be making here. So um, does that mean the females make no testosterone? No, right? And does that mean the guys make no estrogens? No, right. So there's always going to be some interchange here. And um, you'll notice that, and I'll show you a picture of this when we get to the, the female um, hormonal systems. But basically, uh, what's kind of the precursor for all of these, these uh, steroids? It's all going to be cholesterol, right? And so we mentioned before that uh, what's really, what, what organ is really important for um, managing cholesterol and being able to kind of shuttle it around uh, the body? What kind of develops those initial, you know, VLDLs and LDL molecules? The liver, right? So the liver is really important for that. And so you'll notice that the LDL is able to deliver cholesterol out to different tissues. And this is one of the uses for that is that cholesterol will be kind of a common precursor. And then based on um, different uh, stimulating factors, the cells will be able to convert this over. And for guys, a lot of it is going to be converted over to this testosterone. And so um, these are going to be secreted from the testes. So again, the LH and FSH coming from uh, the anterior pituitary is going to be stimulating the testes to start producing testosterone. Um, a lot of it, once it gets secreted uh, out from the testes, you'll notice that a lot of it gets bound to things like albumin. We also have the sex hormone binding globulin that will help to circulate around the tissues. And you'll notice that, that testosterone really isn't the, the most potent androgen we have. It's probably the one that we are releasing in the highest amount. But once we have it out into the tissues, we have this interconversion to this dihydrotestosterone or this DHT. Um, and it's through this enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. And so DHT is actually more potent androgen, has more kind of stimulatory effects here um, and increasing you know, tissue growth or affecting things like, you know, um, uh, you know, muscle development, you know, things like that. Um, and so this 5-alpha reductase enzyme is really, really important because of the fact that uh, this can lead to things, you know, if you have too much uh, stimulation of, say, something like the prostate, what would happen with that? If you had to guess. Yeah, you can have that BPH, right? So if you have uh, an in, you know, hyperplasia of the prostate tissue, that can end up imp uh, impinging on the urethra, and that can cause, you know, uh, difficulty with actual urine outflow, right? Um, and so a lot of that can be uh, due to too much testosterone activity and, and subsequently too much DHT activity. So we actually have medications that will block that enzyme 5-alpha reductase and will help you to lower levels of DHT and will help to kind of shrink down that prostate tissue, right? So that's one way we can kind of combat that uh, if you have too much uh, androgen activity. Also, um, if you have anything that kind of messes with or kind of uh, one, one thing to note, especially any kind of medications that affect um, testosterone formation or estrogens, like all of those can be potentially teratogenic um, to a developing fetus. So you'll see like a lot of these um, type medications are going to be uh, really uh, high risk for, for potentially pregnant uh, females. And so when I say teratogenic, what does that mean? And cause damage, yeah, damage to the fetus essentially. So, uh, for instance, you know, it is uh, when some of these medications have a big uh, warning on it. it says, hey, um, for you know, at-risk uh, women of becoming pregnant who are pregnant, you know, don't even handle these drugs. Like they recommend you know, either using gloves or making sure someone else of non-childbearing potential is actually handling this because the effects of these enzymes uh, are uh, affecting these enzymes in, in a developing fetus and affecting the development of testosterone and things like that or DHT uh, can be very, very deleterious to the child. So we want to to prevent that sort of thing. But um, you'll notice a lot of these hormones are going to be uh, metabolized within the liver. Uh, and then they can eat, once they're conjugated, they can either be excreted uh, into the bile or some of it will be excreted through the urine uh, as well. We'll see that the estrogens and progestin also will be uh, metabolized in the liver. And that, that will have some important clinical impacts on things like coagulation factors and whatnot. But, um, and again, men still produce some degree of estrogen. So uh, if you're comparing a typical male patient versus a female, non-pregnant female, uh, they'd be producing about one fifth or about 20% of the amount of estrogen that that uh, female patient would be. Some of it is thought to be due to um, trying to help with uh, spermiogenesis and, and things like that. So that can be um, one, one theory of why we think we're producing some estrogens. Um, but obviously you can have derangements where they may be producing too much estrogen or not enough, and that can uh, lead to some problems there. 
but uh, how the androgens specifically are working is that once they get into their whatever tissue they're going to be uh, affecting, they're going to get down into the nucleus and they're actually going to be binding to uh, you know testosterone res uh, receptors essentially, and that will change transcription uh, of DNA and that will allow for production of new proteins or growth of the cell, whatever it happens to be. Um, and so would you consider these uh, hormones to be catabolic or anabolic? This is going to be anabolic steroids, right? So these are going to be uh, producing growth. They should be developing uh, the, the body further, right? So catabolic would mean it would be something like, you know, d destroying tissue or or inhibiting growth. So if you look at things like, um, more like your glucocorticoids, like cortisol, that's really not going to be such a uh, anabolic steroid. It's more kind of a, a catabolic. But, you know, when you hear anabolic steroids, you know, especially like in, in abuse and, in, um, you know, athletes and things like that, this is usually what they're referring to, or uh, drugs are going to be kind of in this class uh, uh, steroids. Okay, so again, um, looking at the you know uh, the stimulation by uh, the testes by FSH and LH um, is what kind of kicks off puberty. And when do people usually hit puberty? I think the average is like 13-ish, you know, so you can have it a little bit earlier, you can have it a little bit later, you might be a late bloomer, who knows, but um, basically you're going to see that uh, during the intrauterine weeks or when uh, the fetus uh, is still developing, you will still have high levels of FSH and LH, but that typically is going to drop off, um, you know, early on in life. And so you don't really have any of that kind of stimulated again until um, basically around the time puberty starts up, and that's where you're going to start to see LH and FSH uh, increase in levels, and that will help to, to stimulate the production of, of things like testosterone. probably has something to do with early release of the hormones. You know, it's like one of the things where um, your pituitary is still able to you know, release LH and FSH, so there's probably just some inhibitory factor that we're not super aware of um, that's preventing that from occurring in the first place, you know, until the, the patient is you know, ready for that to, that to develop. But yeah, so you probably end up having increased release uh, early on and that would stimulate the, the testes. And, 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 and so um, it's important that we don't have this occur too early because we're gonna see there's a lot of metabolic effects that occur when uh, the patient hits puberty. And so that can lead to things like you know, diminished stature and, and other issues like that. So we wanna make sure the patient is still developing and, and um, you know, goes into puberty when, when it's right for them. And so you notice that uh, females typically tend to hit puberty a little bit earlier um, than guys do. And you'll notice that as far as their height uh, gain in centimeters per year, uh, they'll spike up a little bit earlier. But notice males tend to have um, kind of higher overall um, height than females on average. Uh, why do you think that is? So what, what do you think these hormones are doing to growth of the bones, right? Because that's ultimately what kind of decides their height. So it can increase some development of the bone, but also when you're looking at um, the actual the growth plates and seeing when those um, when those uh, plates are closing up and you have final kind of uh, uh, elongation of the bone, um, a lot of that is happening throughout puberty, right? So if you have it too early, then potentially you can have issues where those growth plates are going to close up too early and you can end up having uh, diminished stature. And so females tend to hit that a little bit earlier, so they really haven't had as much time for their bones to grow uh, as the males have. And so that's kind of one thought as to why the females tend to be a little bit shorter than males uh, on, on, on average. Obviously, there's going to be people that uh, kind of go outside of that um, on, on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, but looking at development of, of secondary sex characteristics that males once they hit puberty, um, obviously in boys this is going to cause a little bit of a later growth spurt. But we mentioned that you're going to have development of uh, you know, muscles throughout the body, uh, development of the penis, the scrotum, the testes, all of that. Uh, and then also body hair ends up getting stimulated by these androgens. Um, some of it could be related back to the adrenal gland cortex. We mentioned kind of previously um, you have a little bit of androgen <laughs> secreted by uh, the cortex and uh, the adrenal gland, but usually clinically it's not super relevant. Uh, at least for males it's not. It's kind of hard to differentiate, you know, is it all the testosterone come from the testes or from the adrenal gland causing you know development of this hair growth? Um, we can't really tell the difference. So it's probably less clinically relevant for guys than it will be for, for girls, as we'll see in just a little bit. But basically, um, you, know, you may see the tanner stages uh, of puberty being used to, to describe your patients. Basically, it's just saying how uh, far along on the developmental scale they've gotten uh, based on you know, the pubertal changes. You know, so things like you know, hair growth, things like you know, um, uh, development of the penis and the testes and, and things like that. So you can see um, kind of what the hormonal stimulation is going to be on these different characteristics. So again, growth of the testes really shouldn't happen until you have FSH um, uh, in particular. Things like growth hormone can also affect this, and then testosterone have some positive effects here as well. Um, now, if you had someone who is taking, say, like exogenous um, testosterone, if someone's getting, like, say, testosterone injections uh, or transdermal testosterone, what do you think that would do to the testes? Should shrink them. Why is that? 
why, why did they stop producing their own? Yep, so the negative feedback loop is a big thing to, to note there. So again, when you have uh, things like exogenous testosterone being given, you're gonna notice that you know uh, 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 shrinking of the testes is gonna be a common side effect because you're gonna feed back to the pituitary. It's gonna say, hey, you know, we don't really need to release as much FSH and LH. It's not gonna be stimulating um, the tissues in the testes as we'll see in a little bit. Also, it's gonna feed back and inhibit that GNRH from uh, releasing any more um, are inhibiting GNRH release uh, to stimulate LH and FSH. Um, so it's important to remember, you know, some of these side effects are pretty um, readily apparent when you kind of understand kind of the, the underlying background feedback loops um, that are causing this. And then um, growth of things like, you know, the body uh, growth, pubic hair, growth of the penis is all going to be mainly going to be focused on, on testosterone. Growth hormone will also have um, some effect here on, on actual growth of the body and the muscles and things like that. Um, testosterone is normally going to be affecting uh, growth of the larynx. That's how we have the lowering of the voice and the voice cracking as it, it starts to, to lower down. Um, and then your facial, axillary hair, all of that. And then also uh, uh, the, the most fun part of puberty, the smells. Um, development of the eccrine, uh, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, all those things. And again, notice like, you know, what's another common thing you hear about the skin of patients who are taking like exogenous testosterone or testosterone-like substances. They get acne, right? And so of course this is because of the skin changes that testosterone has on uh, developing these sebaceous glands. Typically the thing gets a little bit, uh, the skin gets thicker um, and then you develop these uh, increased sebum production, things like that, and that'll lead to uh, acne developing there. Uh, other androgen effects you may see, uh, you can have uh, male pattern baldness. A lot of times this is going to be related back to um, genetic backgrounds and also on just the amount of androgens that the patient is producing on their own. Um, so that could be one thing you can see uh, as androgen effects. So again, you get hair growth in all the places you don't want it uh, and not the places you do want it, unfortunately. But Anyway, uh, increase that skin thickness I mentioned, that sebum production, which will be contributing to the acne. Basically, you're clogging up those, those pores in the skin. That's going to allow for bacteria to grow, and that leads to the, the acne uh, developing there. And protein muscle development. Um, also, you'll notice that androgens have uh, positive effects on bone deposition. So you'll actually see that, especially in older male patients, you maybe are not producing a lot of testosterone. Um, they may be at risk for things like osteoporosis. It's not as probably as... Um, well looked at as you know a female osteoporosis but certainly um, there's some consideration for giving things like testosterone to help kind of replace that and increase that uh, bone deposition uh, down um, also you'll see that androgens will have positive effects on red blood cell production uh, and they'll also end up seeing that increase in prostate size which can lead to things like either benign prostatic hyperplasia or in some cases things like prostate cancer if the patient happens to be um, particularly sensitive to that or they have the right genetic mutations it kind of predisposes them to uh, having that kind of uncontrolled growth in the presence of things like testosterone. Okay, so again, um, looking at the, the male gonadal secretions, so again, uh, LH is going to be going to and in, in, uh, influencing these lytic cells. Um, we're going to see these are going to be kind of lying within the interstitium. I'll show you another picture of how these um, kind of lie together in just a little bit, but uh, you'll see that the lytic cells are going to be stimulated by LH. Uh, it's going to cause them to, to start to produce testosterone. It's kind of the main site where testosterone production is occurring there. Again, when they get stimulated by LH and FSH, they're going to start to hypertrophy, get bigger as they are producing more and more testosterone, and they're more kind of metabolically active. You'll notice that testosterone will have that negative feedback. Um, it tends to inhibit LH a little bit more than FSH. Clinically, this probably is going to be irrelevant uh, to our uses, but just to, to kind of know that that's, that's the case there. And then FSH is going to be going to these uh, seminiferous uh, tubules, in particular the Sertoli cells, which I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Uh, and this will also secrete inhibin. Uh, inhibin has uh, the ability to feed back and really only inhibit FSH alone. Um, you know, testosterone can affect both uh, of them, but you'll see that inhibin really affects the FSH. Uh, and again, the clinical relevance of this, I'm not really sure of a case where this ever really comes up, but uh, it's just important to know that that is a little bit of a difference there. So again, um, from the hypothalamus into the pituitary, GNRH will stimulate LH and FSH. These lytic cells will start to produce testosterone, which will have positive androgenic effects and will feed back. Testosterone is also going to have positive effects on the Sertoli cells, which is going to help with spermatogenesis along with FSH. Uh, and then these will also inhib uh, release inhibin, which will feed back and inhibit that FSH primarily. So again, um, We'll look at the Sertoli cells in just a minute. Basically, if you're looking at uh, these seminiferous uh, tubules, this is kind of a cross-section of one. This is where a lot of the spermatogenesis is actually occurring here. Um, these are kind of the uh, Sertoli cells where a lot of the actual sperm generation is going to happen. And then you have your Leydig cells that are kind of sitting in the interstitium between uh, the different tubules. We'll look at that in more uh, detail in just a minute. But again, really is going to be affecting mostly the FSH from the inhibit side. Okay. 
Um, so we mentioned the testes are going to have two main compartments. They're going to have these seminiferous uh, tubules here, which you can kind of see them, uh, kind of how they're lying. Um, these are primarily going to have those FSH receptors uh, on the Sertoli cells. Uh, here, if you were looking at a cross section of it, you can notice where the lytic cells are sitting at. There's are going to be you know, influence, you can keep your L's together, I guess, and luteinizing hormone affecting lytic cells. These are where the testosterone occurs here. And then you're going to have these uh, seminiferous uh, tubules. These uh, Sertoli cells are going to be uh, kind of large cells where the uh, basically the uh, spermatogonium are going to be held here. These are kind of the precursor cells to the sperm, uh, and they're going to eventually travel through. And as they develop, um, they'll develop into kind of mature sperm, uh, or mostly mature sperm, and then they're going to get uh, transported out throughout the rest of the testes, which we'll show you in just a second here. Kind of another picture here showing um, the seminiferous tubules, how these are going to go out into uh, the epididymis, which is going to be kind of one of the major storage sites uh, for uh, sperm. Uh, and I think they said something like, you know, six feet or six meters, I think was like the actual, if you were to, to lengthen this whole thing out, which is pretty crazy long. Uh, and this is going to go into the, the vas deferens, and that's going to eventually lead out into uh, for, for sperm, uh, you know, during ejaculation and things like that. So we'll look at that, that pathway in just a few minutes. But again, uh, if you were to look at the actual uh, cells here, um, notice how the sperm cells are kind of developing here in the middle of these uh, tubules. Lytic cells are going to be here um, producing their testosterone. All right, so how does spermatogenesis occur? Um, basically, this maturation is going to be, uh, when you're having this development, you're going to have this uh, induction of this compaction of the chromatin. You're going to have a very kind of uh, tightly packed amount. And again, are these sperm, are they haploid or diploid cells? Should be haploid. We'll look at that in a second. But again, they're only carrying kind of one copy of uh, all their genes uh, for the most part. Or I guess they, they should be, otherwise they're not going to be very functional. Um, but basically, you're going to see the nucleus starts to change shape. They're going to develop this phylogelum that happens here. And again, this is really the only human cell that really has a phylogelum. Uh, specifically, normally you see that like on bacteria and other things. Uh, and they're going to develop this acrosome. We'll show you a picture of this in a second. But basically, um, it's just kind of this harder cap on the, the head of the sperm uh, that will allow for, it has like different enzymes and things like how you're on a day, some proteolytic enzymes. And that's what's going to be responsible for actually the fusion uh, with the ova when uh, actual fertilization occurs there. But the end result, we have spermatogenesis should be four haploid cells, four sperm that only carry one copy of uh, all of our genes. So again, typically with the spermatogonia, we're going to have mitosis occurring here. And for guys, is this kind of a limited process or is this going to be happening throughout most of, of their life? Should be out there most of their life. We'll see that, especially with females, are going to have a limited amount of ova that are going to be uh, potential uh, candidates for, for release, uh, whereas guys can produce this for, uh, for the majority of their lives. Um, they'll have, undergo meiosis. You're going to develop these kind of primary spermatocytes. And this is where you had that first uh, mitotic divi uh, meiotic division, sorry. And thus you're going to have uh, the secondary spermocytes. And then these are going to get further broken down when they undergo the second meiotic division. And now you're going to have these, uh, once you have you know, condensing down of the, the chromatids and all of that, you'll eventually have your, uh, your haploid uh, spermatozoa. Okay? And these can then be released uh, and go out and for potential fertilization. So again, um, here's that acrosome you mentioned. This is kind of developed from the Golgi apparatus, and you're going to notice that it carries a lot of things, kind of lysosomal enzymes. So it can do things like break down uh, kind of the, the harder kind of fibrous shell around the, the ova. Um, uh, things like hyaluronidase, which can break down connective tissue, certain um, proteases and things like that. Uh, but again, developed from the, the Golgi apparatus. Uh, notice here you have this, um, the genetic material will be kind of condensed uh, in here. And then you're going to have the basically the tail. Um, notice there's going to be a lot of mitochondria going to be involved here because you need energy production to cause kind of the, uh, the whip-like motion of the flagellum there. So the tail, uh, you'll notice it has these kind of 11 microtubules uh, throughout here, and this is kind of central skeleton called the axoneme, uh, and then it's going to be powered by this mitochondria. And so the roughly the speed of the sperm, once it's going, can be one to four millimeters per minute. So it doesn't sound too impressive, but uh, I guess it's sufficient enough for at least its purposes once it's trying to find the egg. Right. Um, so once the spermatids, once they are produced, they get moved from the seminiferous tubules. I saw kind of how they were kind of hollowed out in the center where they can uh, have some movement there. Uh, they're eventually going to be uh, hanging out in these uh, the epididymis, as you can see that here. And they're going to be kind of stored for a long period of time. You can see that um, they have some further maturation that occurs in that process, but the main thing is you want to keep them inhibited because, again, once they are um, activated, they're going to be more modal, and they're, you don't really need that when they're kind of just in the storage state. So there's a lot of inhibitory um, substances that kind of keep them uh, kind of in a deeply inactive state for the most part until things are ready for them to, to start swimming. Um, 
It can be stored for about at least a month in some cases. Um, you'll notice that the, the lifespan uh, of a sperm is pretty short when you actually get out to things like room temperature. They only last for, say, like, you know, one to two days. Um, some of them may actually still remain fertile for, say, up to five days once they're actually in the female reproductive tract. Um, so sometimes they can stick around for a little bit longer depending on things like pH, depending on things like temperature and, and other factors that can affect um, the, the activity of the sperm. And roughly, producing uh, males are producing around 120 million uh, sperm per day. Okay, so during uh, ejaculation, you're going to have the spermatozoa actually moving from the epididymis, uh, going through the vas deferens. You can kind of see here, kind of wrapping around uh, the bladder. Uh, it's going to go through this ejaculatory duct, and notice here how it gets involved with the, the prostate. Uh, does anyone know what the prostate does? <clears throat> It's going to help with uh, some of the secretions and things like that that actually uh, form the actual semen there. Um, but essentially, you're going to have these seminal vesicles. They're also going to be involved in uh, some of the extra fluid production. Um, it'll go through the ejaculatory duct. Also, these cowper cells, which are going to be um, also responsible for some uh, secretions. We'll, we'll look at those in just a minute. Um, but then they can be eventually ejaculated out through, through the penis. So when actually looking at the, the makeup of uh, the semen, you can see that roughly 2 to 5%, some places may say like 10%, um, roughly uh, 200 to 500 million spermatozoa should be uh, in uh, a given volume uh, of semen. Uh, you'll notice the seminal fluid coming from uh, that seminal vesicle is going to be roughly about you know two-thirds uh, to three-quarters, uh, and it's going to contain several different types of compounds. It can include things like fructose. Like, Why do you think we want to contain fructose? It's for, yeah, it's for energy production, basically. So it's for those mitochondria. They can start to uh, utilize that to produce energy so they can actually have some energy to, to swim. Um, things like fibrinogen. Uh, and what does fibrinogen do? Yeah, it's part of the, part of a cloud, right? It actually form it thing usually makes things uh, less likely to flow. Which you're thinking, like, why would I want fibrinogen in the semen? Like, why does that make sense? We'll talk about that in a second. Why that is. Um, also, you see there's going to be some prostaglandins. Um, these are thought to be included uh, mainly for um, some purposes once the sperm get into the female reproductive tract. Some, uh, and one of the things you actually notice is that you can actually use prostaglandins to actually help um, when we have a pregnant patient who's uh, getting ready to... Uh, when you're inducing labor, you can actually use prostaglandins to actually uh, help to ripen the cervix. Um, something kind of similar happens here where it helps to facilitate the sperm actually getting into uh, the reproductive tract and kind of getting back to the fallopian tubes. Also, um, the prostaglandins are thought to kind of ca cause the, uh, the female reproductive tract to have kind of a kind of retropulsive kind of movement to try to facilitate the sperm kind of making up to uh, where they need to go. But uh, the prostate uh, fluid, about you know a quarter to two, uh, to a third, uh, is going to be containing things like citric acid, calcium, zinc. Zinc actually uh, has a lot of good antibacterial properties. This is probably also why uh, males are um, somewhat resistant to things like UTIs and whatnot uh, due to this kind of high zinc concentration. Um, you'll notice there's also some coagulation proteins and also a product called uh, profibrinolysin. And if you had to guess, what do you think this does once it's activated? Yeah, so okay, so now we have fibrinogen and then we have something to break it down. So essentially, okay. what we're seeing there is that initially you're going to have some initial activation of fibrin, also this coagulation proteins, and it's going to make the, the semen eventually a little bit more um, kind of viscous, uh, usually for the first 15 to 30 minutes or so after it's been uh, ejaculated. And so the idea there is you want to kind of keep it uh, within the female reproductive tract, kind of have it hang out there for uh, some period of time. And then you're going to notice the profibrinolysin gets activated to fibrinolysin, start to break down the, the fibrin, and that's actually going to help the um, sperm become more modal, things become a little bit more uh, free-flowing, uh, and they can actually make their way through the, the reproductive tract. So uh, we'll look at that process in a little bit later, but that's essentially what they're trying to do is uh, to try to make sure they can stick around, and then when they're ready to start moving, they can they can do so uh, by making that uh, breaking down that fiber and making it less viscous. And then um, you'll have the, the bulbo-urethral gland, which is also those cowper's uh, glands we mentioned before. Um, not a whole lot of, uh, of elimination or uh, of constituents here, but you can see things like mucus to help to, uh, you know, um, help to increase sperm motility, things like that. So it's important, but not quite as uh, high in volume as some of our other um, secretions. <clears throat> Okay, so obviously uh, for ejaculation to occur, you need to have uh, a suitable erection, that way to actually have uh, copulation. Um, it's really important to have this vas... There, there's several components to, to developing an erection. Um, vascular components can be really uh, big here. So if you have someone who has like a vascular injury, that can lead to things like impotence or inability to develop an erection. Um, there's going to be a nervous system component to it, so we'll see where the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system uh, has influences here. And there's also going to be a psychological component, right? So what do you think I mean by psychological component? Yeah, so anxiety, so performance anxiety can be one thing that can actually inhibit this. What else? Depression. 
depression. Yeah, so that can be um, oftentimes you know um, you know male impotence can be linked back to untreated depression in some cases, and you know and depression and anxiety are you know are, are best friends in a lot of cases. Anything else? DTSD, yep. And also think about things like um, mood-altering substances, right? So think about um, patients who have too much alcohol on board. That would also prevent them. Uh, if you have too much CNS depression due to, to medications and things like that, that would also potentially um, lead you to have um, less uh, less stimulation from external things, right? So again, with this kind of psychological component, usually some sort of external stimuli is usually um, stimulating the, the production of the erection in the first place. But you can also have a hormonal component as well. So if you have uh, low levels of testosterone, this can make it more difficult for a uh, male to, to develop an erection in the first place. But um, we'll see here that the, the main thing we're going to be balancing out is going to be the inflow of blood into the penis versus the outflow uh, through the, uh, the venous system. And so one of the things that we can do uh, is influence the actual inflow uh, of blood. Uh, and by having a little bit higher pressure on the venous side, um, you can trap that blood there. And that's going to allow for uh, expansion of, the, of that tissue. Also notice um, this pudendal nerve is going to be um, um, also going to be involved here as well, and we'll look at um, where that gets involved in just a little bit later during the, the ejaculatory phase. So again, uh, the erection is going to happen when blood is coming into these uh, corpus uh, cavernosa. Uh, basically, you're going to have uh, increased blood flow in and kind of diminished blood flow out. And the way that we can do that is by affecting uh, the nitric oxide uh, pathway. So again, this is going to be mainly through the parasympathetic uh, nervous system. And you're going to see that uh, nitric oxide is going to be an increased uh, in release. And we mentioned uh, this before as you know, being... Um, uh, useful for things like dilating coronary arteries when you give nitroglycerin and things like that. Uh, but basically, it's going to help to increase levels of guanylate cyclase, which is going to uh, activate uh, conversion of GTP over to that cyclic GMP. And that's going to cause um, basically uh, decreased uh, influx of calcium into the cell. Uh, it's also going to cause more calcium to be taken back into that endoplasmic reticulum, which leads to smooth muscle relaxation. So basically, on the arteries heading into the penis, you're going to have uh, vasodilation, that allows more blood flow in. The venous side is still kind of impeding blood flow out, and thus you're going to have uh, expansion of the tissue there. All right, so basically all just blood. And so um, what do you call it if you have uh, an erection that goes on for, for too long? A problem, yeah. Definitely a problem. Yeah, priapism is the, uh, is the term for it, right? So that's why I always say on those erectile dysfunction medications, they say, hey, um, you know, if you have an erection for more than how many hours? Like four hours, um, then, you know, call your doctor and, you know, go to the ER or something. Um, so a lot of that has to do with the fact that if you have this kind of um, increased uh, inlet of blood, but you're having kind of diminished outflow of blood, um, you worry about things like vascular injury that can happen there. You worry about not delivering enough oxygen to the tissue because you're impeding flow uh, quite so well. And so it is certainly a urologic emergency, something you uh, need to do about that. Um, what are some ways you think you could deal with that based on what you know about what's actually producing the erection in the first place? You can get a big, big freaking needle. You, okay, so yeah, so that's one way we can do it as well. So the going with the, the big needle uh, route, what can you do? Aspirate blood, yeah. So you can actually take blood out, and that can be one way to actually uh, to deal with the priapism. Uh, you also mentioned vasoconstrictors. So that's another thing we can do. So we can give uh, a drug called phenylephrine that has very high alpha activity. It will cause vasoconstriction and actually diminish the amount of blood flowing into the penis and allow for the venous side to kind of take over and allow for, uh, you guys know the term for uh, losing an erection? Detumescence. Um, so you're trying to go for this detumescence here where you actually uh, have a decreasing amount of either blood that's there or decreasing amount of blood getting to, to the penis, right? So uh, those are some ways you can deal with that. But again, uh, the nitric oxide pathway is really important. Notice here um, that this uh, enzyme, phosphodiesterase 5, is really important for um, breaking down cyclic GMP. We saw phosphodiesterase came up. Uh, we were talking about vision uh, before, but this actually breaks down cyclic GMP uh, and will lead to uh, more constriction of the, the smooth muscle. So uh, basically, when you have something like sildenafil or Viagra, you're inhibiting this enzyme, which leads to more cyclic GMP, which leads to more smooth muscle relaxation, thus you have your, your erection, essentially. That's also why, uh, because it's affecting this nitric oxide pathway, they, they always say never take you know, those medications along with nitroglycerin because it can actually lead to like really, really bad hypotension that can develop because you're kind of attacking the smooth muscle relaxation from both ends of the, the spectrum. So both inhibiting uh, the, the breakdown of the cyclic GMP and also producing more of it in the first place. Yes, ma'am.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's another thing. You can actually have um, a bluing of the vision, so you can actually have the cyanopsia that can occur. That's one side effect that you can see. Uh, a lot of it depends. There's different isoenzymes of, of phosphodesterase. So like you notice here, here's the phosphodesterase 5. This is also the same phosphodesterase that is highly uh, expressed in the lungs as well. So that's why we give like Viagra to little kids that have like pulmonary hypertension. You know, so if you've ever seen see me giving Viagra to a little girl, that's usually why. It's because she usually has a, a cardiac problem and has pulmonary hypertension. So, um, yeah, so you can cause, uh, you can actually cause an actual uh, blindness that can occur there. So that's another big warning thing is like, hey, if you all of a sudden can't see you very well, um, that can be another issue with the, the phosphodesterase. Yep, absolutely. So we'll talk a lot more about that when we get to um, the urology section of, I think, probably farm two. So um, basically uh, looking at emission and eject. Oh, yes, ma'am. No, so, um, yeah, so the activity of PDE5, phosphodiesterase, would break down cyclic GMP. So if I have l lower levels of cyclic GMP, I would have uh, more calcium being released from the endoplasmic reticulum, more calcium coming in from outside of the cell. That would lead to vasoconstriction, right, because calcium is important for causing um, smooth muscle constriction. But by inhibiting that enzyme, by leading to higher levels of cyclic GMP, you're going to have less calcium in the cell, you're going to have smooth muscle relaxation, less vasodilation, more blood flow, interaction. Of course, um, one of the things that you always have to consider is like, you know, people are like, well, you know, do you just, you know, I guess a misnomer is like you take a Viagra and then you just have an erection like the entire time. That's not really the case because you notice that there's going to be other factors uh, that uh, influence that. So things like the parasympathetic nervous system and responding to those outside stimuli are also really important because if you don't have that, um, that you never get the, the, the penis will never get the signal without actually having the erection in the first place. So uh, it's multifactorial and affecting either uh, any. Uh, part of that pathway um, can all affect uh, or lead to things like impotence and, and erectile dysfunction. But um, basically when you are uh, ready for uh, this emission and ejaculation, emission is basically this movement of the semen uh, into the urethra. So typically you'll end up seeing uh, things like constriction of like the vas deferens and, and start to have movement of the, the semen actually into uh, the urethra. That's when you're also going to have um, outflow from things like the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland. Uh, so basically the semen's there in the urethra ready to go. And then ejaculation is going to be that forceful expulsion uh, from the urethra. And this is mainly going to be regulated through the sympathetic nervous system. And it's going to be going to that pudendal nerve. So if you had any damage there, that could lead to um, uh, issues with, with ejaculation. Um, you need to have that sympathetic nervous system activity to cause all those muscles to kind of contract um, synchronously and then cause uh, the ejaculation to occur. Okay. So again, just kind of looking at um, you know, the semen analysis, again, usually the volume is anywhere between a mil and a half to about five mLs, uh, and the sperm count can change. A lot of it can be dependent on, you know, when the last time the guy um, had sex was or, you know, different factors, uh, you know, testosterone levels, all of that can be affecting this here. Um, and you're looking at the actual percentage of modal uh, sperm, you know, say one hour after ejaculation, maybe 70% or higher. But as time goes on, you're going to see a lower and lower proportion that are going to still be uh, viable, right? So you mentioned, you know, in some cases, you may see up to like five days that sperm may actually still remain fertile. It, if they're in the reproductive tract, which is why it's one of those things where, you know, um, you know, a patient doesn't necessarily get pregnant right after uh, they have sex. Sometimes the sperm can sit around for a while and actual um, uh, fertilization may happen several days after um, the last copulation occurred. Um, notice pH is usually kept pretty neutral to a little bit more basic. Um, you know, in some cases you may find that the uh, female reproductive tract is going to be uh, more basic or acidic. Typically, you can see it be a little bit more on the acidic side. So in some cases, the female is not really ready for that. And, you know, ovulation, which we'll talk about later, is not ready to occur. Um, you may see that uh, things be a little bit more acidic. Uh, you may see changes in mucus secretions that will impair um, uh, sperm flow, things like that. Um, so that can all be affecting the actual motility of the sperm there. And then you can look at the fructose concentration just there for energy. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and give you guys a 10-minute break now. We'll come back and then start talking about the females. This is where the, the hard stuff starts. Questions from the first half. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, female reproductive system. Uh, first off with the female reproductive organs. Uh, basically, you're going to see that the female gonads is where the site of the uh, oocytes and the sex steroid production is going to be occurring. Uh, and that's primarily going to happen within the ovaries. You can kind of see the ovaries here, another one over here. Um, and so, uh, so again, we're going to see mostly uh, estrogen being made there. Uh, we'll talk about a few of the different uh, primary constituents of estrogen production, which ones kind of are most kind of clinically important, uh, and then also where progesterone is going to be developed as well. So those are the kind of the two main um, uh, female sex hormones that we're going to be mostly concerned with. 
So uh, we also have these uterine or fallopian tubes. So you can notice here uh, the uterus kind of here in the center, and then you're going to have fallopian tubes coming off of either end. This is typically where you're going to see the uh, the oocyte and the sperm will kind of catch one another, and fertilization will actually happen. Uh, and then where does implantation of the uh, embryo go to? actually into the uterus, right? Um, so I'll, I'll give a disclaimer here. I uh, falsely assume that females got some kind of book when they were born uh, that lets them have some innate knowledge of all of their physiology. Um, so if I say something and assume you guys know what I'm talking about um, and you don't know what I'm talking about, give me a heads up. Because it's just like, you guys know all about your, your cycle. You know all the different LH and FSH, you know, peaks and valleys and stuff. I realize that's probably a false assumption. So I'm going to try to explain it, at least for me and the guys to understand. Um, if anyone needs any extra details, just let me know. Anywho, um, so basically we're going to have these, uh, the implantation is going to happen here within the uterus. That's where the baby is going to be developing and eventually uh, be born from. And so again, uh, these, this ampulla, uh, so essentially once the uh, ovulation occurs, which is basically going to be the uh, the primary ova for that, that month, uh, gets released, it'll actually be traveling through this fimbriae. So it's kind of interesting. I was reading um, that, you know, there's a, there's a potential that the egg actually won't end up getting caught by this fimbriae. Uh, it's a very, very low chance. Like I think at 97% of the time it gets caught appropriately. They're saying that a woman who has uh, one over here and no... Um, uh, no fallopian tube, uh, but only has one on the opposite end. It can actually travel all the way through, and it'll make it just just fine, which I thought was actually kind of crazy. Um, so again, uh, there's there's uh, specific you know hormones and influences that allow that to occur. But anyway, um, so you're gonna have these uh, these uterine tubes, fallopian tubes. That's where primarily the fertilization aspect is gonna be happening there. Um, in the uterus is where we have the site of the embryonic development. You're going to be uh, kind of uh, made up of a few different layers. You have the endometrium, which is going to be the inner layer. This is where the actual implantation occurs and uh, development uh, of the fetus. Uh, this is also the, the lining that gets shed uh, every month if uh, fertilization does not occur. Uh, occur from them. You have the myometrium, which is going to include some uh, some middle muscle. Uh, this is where a lot of the contractions during birth is going to be occurring here. This is where oxytocin will be really important for causing these uterine contractions. Um, this parametrium uh, is going to have this kind of outer layer of connective tissue. And then the cervix is going to be the kind of the narrow bottom region uh, for the uterus. Again, this is where the, the actual baby is going to be coming through. Um, I did not realize in all my life when my, my wife had uh, our first baby, just how many people will be checking uh, to see how dilated you are. I think it's one of the things like you have to see how dilated you are. If once you're 10 centimeters, that's usually when you say, okay, now you're ready uh, for dilation. But man, there's a lot of people that need to check that. Uh, and I was a little horrified by that. <laughs> I didn't get express permission, but I might share a few funny stories uh, from my wife being pregnant. So hopefully she will not get any psychic, you know, her spider sense will not be tingling and kill me later. <laughs> Many of you. Um, so talking about the chemistry of the, uh, the sex hormones, so estrogens and progestins mainly, um, you're going to find that estrogen is going to be secreted by the ovaries, uh, and you're going to find that that's not the only place it gets secreted, but primarily for non-pregnant females, ovaries are the main place. Um, you'll have a small amount coming from the adrenal cortex, but clinically it's not very relevant for, uh, for our purposes. Uh, and then the progesterone, progesterone is going to be the main one there as well, is going to be produced uh, within the corpus luteum. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but it's also going to be within the ovary, and you'll notice that it's going to have a much higher production towards the, kind of the latter half of the ovarian cycle, as we'll see in just a little bit. Again, notice how cholesterol is going to be eventually turned into uh, via several enzymatic uh, changes into things like progesterone, which is our main progestin we're going to talk about. Uh, and then uh, through some conversions, notice how it gets turned into testosterone eventually. Uh, it's going to undergo conversion by this enzyme aromatase. So similar to how 5-alpha uh, reductase turned testosterone into DHT. Um, Aromatase is very important for converting testosterone over into uh, our main estrogens. And so you can see that estradiol is going to be one of the main ones that we're going to be concerned with. That has the, kind of the most activity that we're concerned about. They also have some conversion to things like estrone and estriol, um, but these are not going to be quite as active as we'll see with the, the estradiol. And oftentimes if you're like, you know, replacing, uh, and what happens when like the woman stops producing things like estrogen? That's yeah, when you hit menopause, right? So then again, they're not undergoing the, the uterine cycle every month anymore because they're not really producing any estrogen. And so uh, basically when we replace this, oftentimes we'll get by giving them uh, exogenous estradiol. It can be one of the things we'll use. Um, does anyone know what kind of the major source of, or one of the major sources of estrogen that we'll give a woman uh, in menopause? What animal it comes from? This is a, another fun fact. So there, you guys have ever heard of the drug Premarin? So it's a common um, hormone replacement that we'll give for these women who are menopause. We'll give them estrogen replacements with a drug called Primarin. Uh, the name Primarin actually comes from pregnant mare urine. 
So that's actually where we used to get a lot of our estrogens. You'd have these pregnant mares, uh, you know, female horses, they would be producing a lot of estrogens. Uh, we'd actually be able to collect that from the urine where it would be excreted and then use that to uh, their conjugated estrogens in. So you know, very similar to how we will process our estrogens in, in the liver uh, and send them out as conjugated uh, estrogens. Same thing happens to, to horses as well. So we used to collect that and then uh, purify it and then give it to these women. And it was you know, working essentially the same as our estrogen would uh, on a normal day-to-day uh, -day basis. So pregnant mare urine, primarin, wow, your friends. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so these also end up getting metabolized. With, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, Ooh, that's a good question. Why would we do that? Uh, okay, so prevention of osteoporosis. We'll see the estrogen has positive effects on uh, laying down new bone. What else? Yeah, they get a lot of dryness. So you have basically atresia of the, uh, the the endometrium and the vaginal tract. Um, so essentially what you see, they can have uh, called dyspareunia, which can be like, you know, kind of painful, um, uh, painful sex. So you have a lot less lubrication. So um, that can be one thing we can actually give in, uh, estrogens for to help kind of develop that tissue again. Anyone else? Any other ones? You ever heard of a hot flash? Right, so oftentimes uh, women in menopause can have this kind of cutaneous vasodilation. It's kind of um, uh, my mom called them power surges. I thought it was a much better, more positive way to, to reference them, but um, they get very hot and it's very kind of uncomfortable. So you can give estrogens to, to prevent that from occurring there. Uh, I think it's a little bit of a taper. Like you'll start to notice function will start to decrease. It's not like all of a sudden your ovaries are like, nope, we're done. We're hitting retirement. We're done for the day. Um, I think it's going to be a little bit more kind of a gradual process, and you'll start to see some of those menopausal symptoms start to pop up, and that's where you can consider um, replacement. There's going to be some downsides to that, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. But essentially, that's why you replace that. Just because again, like you know, your bodies are used to having so much estrogen around, and when you start to take that away, you're going to have this kind of withdrawal type of effects, um, and so you can see those those things pop up. So anyway. Um, so again, these are metabolized in the liver. Uh, you'll notice that estrogens also have a positive effect on producing coagulation uh, clotting factors, right? So this is why uh, if you ever have like a young female who develops a clot, usually either a DVT or deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism, one of the first questions you ask is, are you on birth control? Yeah, absolutely. Because again, when you're giving these exogenous estrogens, and again, um, what, what's kind of the theory behind birth control? Why does that work? Uh, a little bit on the progestin, but essentially the, by giving estrogen, what does that do to that feedback loop? Yeah, exactly. So it shuts down release of FSH and LH, right? So basically by uh, activating that negative feedback loop, um, you basically prevent ovulation from ever occurring the first. That's the, the goal, at least. Um, so essentially by giving all this excess uh, estrogen activity, um, one of the things you can see is it uh, metabolized in the liver and that will produce more clotting factors, has positive stimulation there. That's where you see the risk for um, clots happening. Right, so that's one of the big risks, and that's why you know, um, you know, people will, you know, yeah, you know, that's why they say like, you know, let's get over the counter birth control, and I say like, that's probably a good thing for a lot of people, but there's like some subset of people who may be more at risk for developing those clots, and that could be potentially deadly. So that's one of the kind of the big risks you worry about um, with, with uh, patients being on birth control. There's some other risks as well, which we'll talk about uh, probably more in depth than in farm. But anyway, um, but the liver effects are really important there. You also see some changes in things like your HDL and your LDL. Um, uh, usually some positive uh, effects on your cholesterol that can occur from the, uh, the effects of estrogens within the liver. So again, um, normally you'll see that uh, during uh, the kind of fetal development and, and during the kind of initial stages of birth, um, you're going to have uh, you know, some release of FSH and LH uh, during childhood is going to be very minimal. Uh, and then once we hit to the pubertal stages, that's where we're going to start to have the, the surges in LH and FSH, and we're going to uh, basically be in your reproductive years. Um, what do you call that first uh, menstrual cycle that occurs? Yeah, menarche uh, is going to be occurring there, and then that's going to be, uh, you know, basically uh, cyclical uh, from there on out until you end up hitting menopause, usually around, you know, late 40s to 50s-ish. Um, and then you'll see that, why, why do you think the FSH and LH are going to uh, go up so high here? Yeah, there's no negative feedback. So essentially, um, you're not producing any more estrogen at that point. Uh, and so the LH and FSH are still going to be, uh, they're never going to be inhibited. Uh, and so they're going to be uh, kind of chronically high levels. 
Okay, um, so looking at the secondary sex characteristics that occur during puberty, uh, you know, uh, similar in some features uh, to, to male patients, so we'll get those growth spurts, uh, the breast development, uh, they'll have the first kind of menstrual flow that occurs there, and then you're usually going to see that body hair is not necessarily going to be uh, from production of estrogens necessarily, but you will see that uh, some of those androgens from the adrenal gland will be much more prominent. So I mentioned it's not super relevant for, for guys, but certainly you'll see development of, you know, hair in the axilla um, in different places, and that's going to be related back to those androgens. So again, uh, appearance of the breast buds, you know, hormonal stimulation primarily going to be from estrogen. Uh, progesterone is going to be affecting this as well. Um, this is one of the reasons why also you're worried about uh, for certain at-risk patients. Uh, if they have certain gene mutations that make them more at risk for breast cancer, you also don't want to give them exogenous estrogens because that can actually stimulate that. Um, we'll talk about drugs that can get around the, those problems there. But having um, stimulation by estrogen will, again, develop the breast tissue. Um, but also things like growth hormone, thyroxin, which is coming from where? Thyroid, yeah, thyroid gland uh, is, can be important there. Uh, insulin, cortisol, all of those can be positive effects there on, on developing the breast tissue. Um, I mentioned the pubic hair is going to be coming from adrenal androgens. Uh, again, not a ton of them being released there, but just enough to cause a, the development of that hair. Um, you know, the first menstrual flow is going to be coming from estrogen and progesterones. Um, also, you know, sweat glands and things like that. The underarm hair is going to all be from the adrenal androgens as well. Okay, so looking at uh, our stimulation of or based our negative feedback loops here. So again, the hypothalamus is also going to be releasing GnRH, which goes down to the anterior pituitary, very similar to what we saw with the, the male patients. Um, you notice the FSH, LH is going down to the gonads. Uh, basically, you'll see LH is going to have these positive effects on these uh, thecal cells, which will also produ uh, be producing these progestions. Um, you'll notice that even though it's making some androgens, a lot of that gets con converted back over into um, estrogen in a lot of cases. So we don't really necessarily, um, even though some androgens are being produced, again, converted back over to estrogen pretty quickly by that aromatase enzyme. And then um, you'll also see that um, we're also going to be increasing some release of inhibin. Inhibin is going to feed back. And what, which one does that inhibit, LH or FSH? Yeah, FSH is going to be the primary thing that inhibin is going to be affecting there. So very similar to male patients. Um, uh, it's just a matter of which hormones are actually going to be produced based on their, their uh, sex organs. So um, looking at the ovarian uh, follicles, we'll get... Um, oogenesis in just a, a few minutes here, but essentially uh, looking at the ovary, uh, you can see here that the uh, ovarian follicle is going to be secreting estriol, uh, or I'm sorry, estradiol. Estradiol is going to be the main kind of uh, physiologically active estrogen uh, that we're going to be secreting there that we're uh, mostly concerned with. And then as the development occurs, uh, once ovulation actually happens here, uh, all these granulosa cells end up kind of developing this corpus, um, corpus luteum, and this is where you're going to have a lot of the progestin being uh, developed here. So this is occurring later on in the cycle, which is why you see the progestin doesn't get uh, majorly secreted until kind of the second half of the menstrual cycle, as we'll see in just a little bit. There's some good graphs that will kind of show you um, how those differences will, will occur there. But um, again, basically the granulosa cells uh, are going to be releasing that inhibin. Specifically, it's going to be uh, inhibiting release of FSH uh, when it does that negative feedback loop. Okay, so again, here's our menstrual cycle. Yeah. Different menstrual. Anyway, um, I was trying to, it was hard to find a good cartoon for that. There's not very good, many good ones on Google Image Search. Um, so anyway, looking at the, the actual menstrual cycle, what's happening here, so you can see that uh, basically um, you're going to start off with these primordial follicles uh, that will eventually develop in these primary follicles. This is kind of where we're starting at as far as um, the menstrual cycle goes. Gonna, uh, women are going to have a set number of uh, these primary follicles available. And as we start to have secretion of things like FSH and LH, we're going to see, and there's some better graphs, we'll show you kind of how the hormones will change uh, throughout the, the period. And again, how long is this period usually? Usually 28 days, and so certainly it can be shorter, certainly it can be longer in some cases, but usually around 28 days is kind of our, our, um, our standard. And so basically, and of course most of your patients may not be standard, but 20 days is what we're going to go with. Um, so you'll notice that FSH and LH is going to start to stimulate the development of these follicles. This is where you're going to eventually get this kind of big graphene uh, follicle, and then that can then be released. And this, uh, this release of the ova, this kind of mature ova that's ready for implantation, is called ovulation. So this is the kind of the big thing we're concerned about as far as uh, fertility goes. This usually happens around day 14. Obviously, if you have a longer uh, uh, period, uh, you can end up having um, this occur later. If you have a very short period, you may have this occurring earlier. But generally, for a 28-day period, right about day 14 is when this is actually uh, happening here. 
And then, so again, a lot of estrogen production during the early stages here, uh, and you're going to notice that progesterone is going to be uh, more so made towards the, the kind of the latter half of the period. So you're going to notice some more progesterone from that corpus luteum. That eventually will kind of break down and eventually go, turn into um, corpus albicans, which will then eventually be reabsorbed. Um, and then also the other big thing to note is going to be this uterine um, uterine tissue and how this is actually going to be developed. So you can kind of divide this up into the ovarian cycle and the menstrual cycle or the uterine cycle. Uh, I'll probably talk about them kind of interchangeably, um, but just know that both of these processes are happening here in tandem. Uh, but essentially kind of at the early stages here on day one, you always consider uh, the first day of menses, uh, day one for the cycle. Um, you're kind of sloughing off a lot of this material from the previous month. And then as you have uh, positive effect from the estrogen and the progesterone, you're going to have development of the endometrium. And what's the purpose of developing all this tissue? Yeah, it's getting ready for implantation, and this is providing a lot of nutrients. Um, a lot of times you'll see some of the cells actually start to, to uh, degrade down this epithelia and allow for um, those nutrients to be taken up uh, for the fetus. And then eventually once they realize, that, hey, there's no implantation happening here, there's no fertility or no um, uh, actual fertilization has occurred, uh, to say, hey, we need to get rid of this. And the big thing you notice is that when the corpus luteum is um, degraded, once it's kind of run out, it's noticing that there's no, um, we'll talk about what actually stimulates this when we talk about human cornata, um, chorionic gonadotropin, uh, or HCG. Uh, once it says, hey, there's no fertilization happening here, this will actually decay, and then uh, estrogen and progesterone drop will occur right, because there's basically no more uh, tissue there really producing a lot of estrogen and progesterone. Once that drops down, that withdrawal of those two uh, components is going to lead to sloughing off of this endometrium, and then you can get ready for a new cycle all over again, okay? So we'll go into more detail on this, um, but this is kind of the general um, process that's going to be occurring there. So um, looking at the monthly cycle we mentioned can range anywhere from 20 to 45 days, but 28 days is pretty uh, pretty standard. Uh, looking at your release of both estradiol and uh, progesterone, and then looking at LH and FSH, you notice here um, that you're going to have kind of at the beginning of it, you're going to notice, and of course, menstruation is probably that first four to five days or so. Uh, and again, first day of menses is always going to be the start of the period. Um, you're going to see that FSH is going to be a little bit higher in, in secretion there, and this is going to eventually stimulate uh, the development of that follicle. The purpose here is we're going to have uh, one single ovum um, that gets released uh, during ovulation. Uh, the goal is to have one. Certainly, there's a possibility you can have more than one, but we'll see that um, basically once that one follicle really starts to develop, it likes to kind of shut down the other ones, even though the multiples are going to be kind of activated early on, which you know, usually there's probably like four to eight maybe even up to 12 follicles that kind of start out in the period like you know getting developed really only one of them is going to be uh kind of the the winner it's kind of like the highlander uh in the ovaries only one may survive right also a lot of bloodshed happens there as well um so it kind of makes sense but anyway um so again we are getting that that one ovum ready ready to go for for ovulation that's when you're seeing a lot of that estradiol being released there is when the ovum is uh, the follicles developing it's releasing a lot of estrogen uh, and then uh, once you have the actual ovulation occur it's going to drop down a little bit and this is mainly going to be that corpus luteum it's producing a lot of progesterone some estrogen uh, and you'll notice that you have this lh surge so we talked about this before as being a positive feedback loop, uh, but this is also what's going to lead to uh, the actual ovulation to, to occur. So we'll talk about this more in detail in just a few minutes. But again, primary components, you have any kind of uh, aberrations in any of these, this can lead to um, anovulation, which means uh, the patient would not be fertile for that particular month. So uh, if you don't have enough GnRH, you're not going to be making enough LH or FSH. If you don't have any LH or FSH, you're not going to be producing enough estrogen or, or progesterone potentially. Uh, and similarly, if you have too much estrogen or progesterone, that can feedback, inhibit uh, these kind of upstream steps and prevent ovulation from occurring, which is what we do when we give birth control or at least uh, hormone-based birth control. There's some other ones that we can do as well that are non-hormonal based, but we'll talk about those later. Um, so the actual uh, starting out, we're looking at the, the oogenesis that occurs here. So again, before birth, um, you're going to notice these primordial germ cells are going to undergo kind of repeated cell divisions, kind of getting ready for um, getting ready for uh, you know, developing these different oocytes and kind of getting uh, kind of a baseline level of, of what's you know uh, going to be available for that woman for the, her entire life. Um, you're going to get this primordial ovum that develops here. And then at birth, basically you have one to two million uh, oocytes that are going to be developed here. And these primary oocytes are kind of arrested in this prophase one. So we mentioned meiosis uh, typically is going to occur in kind of two steps. Um, notice once we have this uh, this prophase one has occurred, it kind of gets stopped there. Okay. And so at birth, you have one to two million of these. Um, not to say that these are all going to be um, potentially viable, because you'll notice that at puberty, uh, the number gets cut down to probably about 400,000, which is still way more than what the actual woman will uh, utilize in her lifetime. Um, but that is what, basically what it gets cut down to. 
So during puberty, um, you're going to notice that the uh, meiosis is going to continue on. Um, you will have uh, this first polar body that gets uh, formed here. And so polar body, what does that do for us? Nothing. We like to get rid of it. It doesn't really do anything for us, right? So the point is, um, whereas with spermatogenesis, you notice how many sperm cells do we get from that initial um, uh, meiotic division? We get four, right? And here, we're only going to get one viable ova um, from this uh, cell division. The rest of them are going to get sent off as, as polar bodies. You may see that this first polar body will also um, divide, but they, they're not going to be useful for anything. They're not going to be ready for fertilization uh, by any means. But basically, once you have the primary oocyte and you're having um, development um, during puberty, um, you can start to have uh, the secondary oocyte uh, start to develop here. And this here, it actually gets uh, arrested over in metaphase two, because again, this first step in meiosis, meiosis one has already occurred. Uh, so we're getting rid of that first polar body, and this is kind of stopped here in metaphase two, right? Um, and then once it gets ovulated, it's going to be released out. You can kind of notice how these granula, um, granulosa cells are going to uh, surround uh, the ovum to perform that primary follicle, uh, the primordial follicle, and then when it's kind of ready um, uh, for development, the primary follicle is, is going to be formed here. So just a lot of granulosa tissue around here. As that starts to develop, you get this pre-ovulatory mature follicle. Once that gets released, that can then determine that corpus luteum, which you mentioned is really important for releasing uh, a lot of progesterone. Um, I think that's just all of, uh, are going to be available. Yeah, I, I don't know, just from the meiosis, kind of turning a lot of those into um, the polar bodies and kind of getting a lot of those. Um, that could be a possibility. Um, but yeah, that's, on average, usually how much are, are kind of available at that point. Yeah. But again, um, you probably only go about 400 of them through a, a typical lifespan. Um, all the rest of them uh, never end up getting utilized, which is why you can have you know, potential like, you know, donation. You can you know, store eggs for a long period of time and still really have uh, enough that are available for, for your own use, uh, potentially. But anyway, uh, once you have a uh, release of uh, the ova during the uh, ovulation period here, you'll notice that corpus luteum gets formed. Um, and again, it's still the second uh, meiosis has not occurred here, and it will not occur until actual fertilization happens. So once the sperm comes in, um, he will uh, basically kind of fuse in with the, uh, the ova. There's no really mixing of, of uh, genes or DNA at this point, but you'll notice it will undergo meiosis two at this point and get rid of this uh, second polar body. Right, so that would be uh, the last polar body there, and then you have the, the zygote. Basically, once that polar body's gotten rid of, um, the, the two sets of DNA will come together, and now you have a, a zygote formed. Okay, make sense? We'll talk about it more in, uh, in detail a little bit later. We're talking about fertilization in just a few minutes. But basically, uh, the point here is that, you know, once we're at this phase, we're getting ready for uh, puberty and, and, and um, the menstrual cycle to, to occur here. Okay, so I mentioned uh, primary oocytes are going to be contained uh, within those primary follicles, and then in response to FSH, that's where we're going to start to have development of, of a select number of those um, as, uh, uh, follicles. Basically, six to twelve end up getting stimulated per month. Uh, really, only one ends up maturing. The other ones end up going through atresia. Some of it has to do with um, whichever one happens to develop most ends up releasing some inhibitory factors that will kind of shut down the other ones and cause them to be uh, to lost or cause them to be lost. And so as this develops, as uh, you know, basically you have the, the primary follicle here, as it gets developed, you'll notice that uh, it will have these kind of fluid-filled vesicles called the secondary follicles. Uh, that's all getting it ready for, for ovulation to occur here. So again, FSH is causing that initial stimulation. You'll notice that those primary follicles will also end up getting kind of upregulated LH um, uh, receptors, which will be important for this LH surge that happens here right, uh, right before the time of ovulation. So again, kind of another picture kind of showing is oogenesis is occurring here. So again, uh, kind of early phases, you have a lot of mitosis going on. This is before birth actually happens. Uh, and then you're going to have this kind of primary oocyte. Uh, meiosis one is happening here. Notice that um, the first polar body may end up dividing. Again, note here, these are still haploid, even though they contain uh, two sets of uh, two copies of, of their own genes, but it's only haploid at that point. Um, polar bodies are going to get eliminated. They're not really used for anything uh, versus only one actual ovum gets developed and is mature, which can be potentially released during uh, ovulation. And so you can notice here, um, here's the primordial follicles that get developed into primary. Uh, with time, you'll start to see this development. Uh, once it gets released into uh, uh, the fimbriae, so you kind of notice here's the, the ovary itself, here's the fimbriae kind of attached to it. Um, these are able to be going on for implantation versus the, uh, the rest of the uh, granulosa tissue is going to be turned into that corpus luteum. Okay? Eventually, if it doesn't get used, it turns that uh, corpus albicans where it can be reabsorbed uh, um, at a later time. 
Okay, so after ovulation, that remaining follicle uh, turns into that uh, corpus luteum. Again, it's going to be secreting both estradiol and progesterone. Um, and so that's why you saw those kind of surges after the, the actual ovulation occurs. Uh, higher amounts of progesterone typically uh, than estrogen at that point. But um, And you'll notice that uh, with a lot of like, birth controls, uh, especially ones that are um, either biphasic or triphasic, you'll actually see differing doses of things like the progesterone component of that because it's trying to mimic um, the actual uh, menstrual cycle that a woman would have uh, normally. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that, but some um, some drugs will try to, to mimic that to try to keep normal uh, hormonal levels for, for females. But um, again, we'll see how, how big a role these are going to play in just a few minutes. So um, again, uh, you can kind of divide these uh, these phases we've kind of been uh, alluding to into uh, three different phases, uh, kind of the follicular phases, uh, ovulation, and then that luteal phase. Um, early when you're having development of the, the follicle, it's the follicular phase, uh, around day 14 or so for a typical 28-day cycles when you have ovulation and release of the mature ova, and then that luteal phase will be kind of the second half. Again, more estrogen being uh, produced here, not a ton of progesterone. Uh, then in the second phase, you have a lot more progesterone and also some estrogen being made there. Again, usually the uh, follicular phase is going to be that first uh, one through 13 days. Again, it can be kind of variable. Um, one of the big challenges, that, especially women who have a hard time uh, conceiving, is trying to figure out when specifically they ovulate. Because you'll notice there's kind of a small window uh, when fertility can actually occur there. Uh, and so, again, if you're having ovulation at uh, different periods uh, or different points within the period, um, that can kind of uh, screw that up a little bit. But um, the graphene follicle is kind of that final mature follicle that is getting that ova ready to be released uh, during ovulation there. Again, increased levels of estradiol, mainly from those granulosa cells being um, made within the, the follicle. Okay, so again, uh, initially is going to be, the follicular phase is going to be initiated by the FSH. Notice how this is going to be uh, higher in secretion than LH initially. Uh, you can see that uh, also one of the things that you'll look at when um, trying to determine if someone's uh, ready for conception uh, is uh, looking at their body temperature. I think one of the things you actually look at, because you typically will see about a, a half degree CC, uh, half degree centigrade uh, rise in their temperature uh, when they're getting ready to, to ovulate. So that's one of those things where um, women can actually track their temperature every single day and kind of figure out where they think ovulation is most likely to occur uh, by looking at their temperatures. But again, as the, the FSH is stimulating uh, the follicle development, estradiol mm -hmm. concentration is going to be going up right until you uh, get before the, the ovulation phase. And again, um, you'll notice that the estradiol is also stimulating production of LH receptors on that graphene follicle, that main one that's going to be uh, releasing the mature ova. Uh, increased estradiol is also stimulating the hypothalamus, is also going to be causing uh, further GnRH to be released, which is causing this positive feedback loop where more LH is going to be coming, and we call this the LH surge. Okay, so not only does the follicle have more LH receptors available to uh, respond to this, it's also stimulating more LH uh, to be produced. So it's, again, that positive feedback loop. So that's why you see right before, uh, right before or during ovulation, you notice a big surge in LH. Okay. Also notice um, the estrogen is still causing development of the, uh, the endometrium here. Uh, it's not going to be quite as developed as it will be at the end of the cycle, but basically you're starting to see some of that development occur uh, after the, the end of the last menses. All right. Uh, LH surge causes the ovulation to happen. It causes that graphene follicle to rupture, releasing the oocyte. Uh, the, the rest of the uh, follicle is going to turn into the corpus luteum. The ova is going to go into the fimbriae, into the ampulla of the uh, fallopian tube, where it can then be potentially uh, implanted with the sperm. Again, during that luteal phase, once the... Um, LH has stimulated ovulation, rupture follicle turns into corpus luteum. You're going to see a large increase in the actual progesterone being secreted. Uh, still, estradiol is being made here, but uh, again, the, the main thing here is progesterone. Again, here's when we're seeing a lot of development of the endometrium getting ready for uh, potential fertilization, implantation of a uh, um, uh, you know, potential fetus into uh, the tissue there. So, you typically see the progesterone peak about a week after ovulation uh, during this, this phase here. Again, the same picture, just showing you uh, this development here. We kind of talked about this already, but um, again, estrogen is going to be the primary focus here, causing development of this uh, follicle, release ova, uh, and then you're going to see the corpus luteum. The main thing will be producing progesterone, estrogen, further developing the endometrium, uh, and then getting ready for implantation. Um, so high levels of estradiol and the progesterone uh, end up feeding back to 
uh, the not only the hypothalamus but also the pituitary gland. So this is when you actually end up having uh, decreases in LH and FSH. So you saw that after that LH surge, uh, there's increases in amount of estradiol and, and progesterone are going to cause that to drop. That's going to cause uh, less stimulation of production of estrogen and progesterones. Um, and so by doing that, you're going to end up causing um, a sudden withdrawal, you know, especially when the corpus luteum kind of gets to the, the end of its lifespan and it's not uh, not detecting any uh, production or any fertilization. That's when it's going to kind of die off, and that's when you have that big drop in estrogen and progesterone levels, that's when you have the actual menses uh, occur at that point, and then you're starting a new cycle. And those, those inhibiting its producer is really only going to be inhibiting the FSH only, um, but certainly the estrogen and progesterone can feed back and then inhibit um, both LH and FSH. Okay, so again, looking at uh, the uterine development, the changes to that endometrium really is going to um, getting things ready for that um, uh, ready for implantation there. That's going to be highly vascular. Uh, a lot of uh, very uh, nutritious cells that are going to be there for potentially uh, the um, zygote to implant into and the fetus can start to kind of feed off of. We'll look at the development of things like the placenta in just a little bit when we talk about the actual fertilization um, aspect. Okay, so again, um, the menstrual, the uterine cycle is referring again to that 28-day cycle. Usually it's going to be this uh, endometrial buildup and then sloughing of the cells uh, in response to those hormones. So again, usually it's going to be withdrawal of estrogen and progesterone that causes uh, the sloughing of the cells, uh, but they initially, are, their stimulation is going to cause development of the endometrium tissue. Again, it's highly vascular, which is why you see um, it can be a very bloody process because you're losing a lot of blood and, and uh, other cells and things like that when the actual menses occurs. Uh, you'll notice there's going to be three phases here as well, similar to what we saw with the, the ovarian cycle, the, the menstrual proliferative and secretory phases. So again, um, cycle begins with menstruation and actually losing the, those tissues there. Um, and then once we have a uh, increased secretion of estradiol, uh, that's going to start to develop the, the tissue back again. Basically, uh, the bleeding will stop once uh, the re-epithelialization of the endometrium has occurred, and that kind of gets it ready again for uh, to be more receptive to things like estrogen and allow for development of that tissue. And again, when you have uh, large amounts of progesterone being made, you have even further development here. Um, one of the things you run into and it's important to have a balance between estrogen and progesterone because one of the things we see with, uh, say, uh, postmenopausal women who are not producing uh, estrogen or progesterone, if you give them only estrogen and they still have an intact uterus, um, you can actually end up having kind of unchecked growth of this endometrium and they actually have increased risk for endometrial cancer. So one of the things they do for women who still have an intact uterus, they have not had a hysterectomy or something, um, they will actually give them an estrogen and a progestin. And that helps to keep this regulated so that way they don't have just uh, continuing growth of the endometrium. Uh, it will allow it to uh, be uh, developed, but stay stable, right? And then for those women who are taking that, even though they're postmenopausal, if you were to withdraw that drug for them, what would happen? They would slough it off just like normal, right? So again, uh, we're, we're mimicking these endogenous hormones, but the same effects are going to be occurring uh, as we as we change concentrations or uh, give the drug or, or remove it. So again, this proliferative phase is going to occur while the ovary is still in the follicular phase. So it's kind of early on. Uh, our increasing estradiol stimulates the growth of the endometrium. It's going to become much more vascular, and it's also going to develop this progesterone receptor. So this uh, development of progesterone receptors gets it ready uh, for that more uh, proliferative phase. I'm sorry, it gets it ready for the, the secretory phase. So again, the secretory phase occurring when the ovaries are in the, the luteal phase. Uh, basically, the secretion of progesterone stimulates the endometrium, gets even more uh, thick, becomes more vascular, gets really um, uh, a good environment ready for uh, implantation of an embryo in order to, to, to form a fetus. Um, it's going to be able to uh, you know, nurse that, that growing embryo is where the placental tissue is going to eventually going to be developing uh, as well. And so, of course, that's going to be the main area for uh, you know, uh, nutrient and oxygen supply to the baby. And again, uh, when you have that fall in uh, estradiol and progesterone concentrations here, that's when you're going to get to a point where you say, okay, well, or actually you can see better over on this side, and you're actually dropping estrogen progesterone levels. It says, okay, obviously fertilization has not occurred. We can get rid of all this tissue. We don't need it anymore. Uh, and you get ready for a new cycle to occur all over again. Okay. Um, what would occur if I were to give uh, consistent levels of estrogen and progesterone, um, say, every single day? They would, yeah, they would never have menstruation, essentially. So that's actually one of the things. Uh, you guys have heard of the, the oral contraceptive seasonique or seasonal? So those are actually ones that are designed to make it so that females will not um, have as many periods throughout the year. You can actually give them uh, consistent levels of estrogen and progesterone for, say, three months or, in some cases, up to a year. And because you have a balance between estrogen and progesterone, you don't really have unchecked rampant growth of the endometrium. 
And so uh, basically they can go that whole period and then they'll have a withdrawal um, effect where they basically will take placebo pills, essentially, or sugar pills uh, for a week. They will slough off that tissue and they can start all over again. So some patients, you know, um, uh, they can have very severe uh, effects from, uh, from menstruation. It can be a very, uh, very difficult time for them. Um, and so giving them fewer periods throughout the year can actually be uh, a pretty uh, good thing for them. And you know, there's really not any, uh, at least that we know of, any untoward effects from causing this kind of prolonged uh, exposure to estrogen and progesterone, as long as they're going to be in balance. Uh, with one another, you don't have that unchecked growth and, and risk for things like endometrial cancer. Okay. So again, uh, looking at the uterine cycle early on, you're going to have that follicular phase um, uh, within the ovary. In the uh, endometrium, you're going to have the menstrual phase. Again, you're going to have low levels essentially of uh, FSH and LH. Um, here you're going to see low levels essentially of estradiol and progesterone. This is again very early on, so this is actually during the, the actual menses is occurring here. Um, should be seeing some uh, you know, development in some of the follicles. Again, most of that is going to be related back to a little bit higher levels of FSH early on. Uh, and then you're going to see, again, at this point, the, you're shedding a lot of that endometrial tissue you did not need uh, from the previous month. During the later parts, the follicular phase is going to be um, uh, more proliferative in the endometrium. You're going to have higher levels of FSH. Um, this is before the LH surge actually occurs here. Um, so estradiol secretion from those follicles is helping to develop uh, the, uh, the endometrial tissue and getting it ready, um, increasing that thickness, increasing mm -hmm. the vascularity. And then finally, the ovulatory phase, um, the, the endometrium still hasn't really changed a whole lot, but that LH surge is what's going to lead to having the, uh, the follicle uh, rupturing, releasing the ova. Corpus luteum is going to start to develop there. Um, see, estradiol secretion typically is going to fall to some degree, um, but progesterone is going to go up. Uh, and then you can see, uh, again, no, no big changes here, just on this kind of one-day period. Um, and then finally, the luteal phase is going to be kind of uh, considered the secretory phase here in the endometrium. Um, F LH and FSH have uh, started to decline, but you do have decent levels of progesterone and estrogen kind of developing the endometrial tissue. Uh, again, this is where you're waiting for potentially implantation to occur uh, of, the, of the egg. How long, how long is the, the egg kind of good for after the ovulatory phase? It's only a couple of days, like maybe only one to two days or so. So we'll look at that in just a few minutes. But again, this is not a, a very long period um, where the patient is going to be uh, potentially fertile. And so we'll look at um, some of the factors that can influence that in just a little bit. We can just another slide kind of showing you the, um, the different phases here and the kind of lineup with one another. So it's important to realize that, you know, um, you know what's causing each of these uh, phases to occur, um, being able to kind of relate that back to, you know, if I said, okay, you know, a patient um, immediately has, you know, withdrawal of estrogen and progesterone, what's that going to cause to occur, you know, what effect will that have on the endometrium? Okay, it will cause sloughing of the tissue due to that not having that effect around anymore. So just be familiar with kind of what's going on through each stage in the cycle. Okay, so we mentioned uh, there's contraceptive methods, um, hormonal based or one way that we can do this. So we would include uh, synthetic estradiol and different progesterones. Um, basically, it's going to be acting like kind of a prolonged luteal phase, essentially, right? So we're going to be giving um, these consistent levels. And so we mentioned sometimes you'll find some that are uh, biphasic or triphasic, where they'll try to mimic um, the changes in uh, hormonal concentrations that you would see in the normal cycle. Um, you don't necessarily need to do that. It just depends on, on how the patient responds to it. But uh, it produces that negative feedback, so your GnRH level should be diminished. Uh, LH and FSH should be diminished as well, so basically no ovulation ever occurs. Uh, is this the perfect method? No, no, no method is truly perfect except for abstinence. Not that I'd say everyone should do abstinence. Probably not a bad idea, but um, people are going to do what people do. Uh, and so uh, just realize that you know no method is actually going to be 100% perfect. Um, even if you did things like the calendar method, be like, well, I know you're not ovulating right now. We're good to go also not going to work very well because again it only takes once for you to really regret that if you weren't really ready for it as having one year old i can tell you just kidding not really one of mine just kidding um anywho so when you're on these oral contraceptives there's usually a week of placebo pills essentially where um they will uh basically take no drug whatsoever that causes that withdrawal effect where you end up sloughing the endometrium they can have their their menstruation essentially um why do we give placebo pills why do we just tell them just don't take anything for that week Yeah, so they, they stay consistent. They are still taking something every single day because you're more likely to have, um, you know, someone forgets to take it, you know, when they're supposed to start their, their new pack, um, things like that. That can decrease compliance. That's the reason why we include these placebo pills. Um, some will contain like iron, especially for women who are more at risk for um, anemia. Because, uh, again, when you're losing all that blood, that you're losing all the iron to go along with it. Um, so some patients may need, you know, extra iron and, and things like the oral contraceptive. So sometimes I'll include that. Um, but, yeah, the, the main thing is to keep it consistent because, again, if you um, miss a day, um, 
that's not going to necessarily, you know, make or break that cycle. But if you miss like two days or more, uh, it gets to be much more iffy and your chances for, for failure of the contraception go, goes up um, uh, to some degree. Okay. And again, you can look at things like changes in body temperature that can correlate along with uh, ovulation that occurs here. It has to do with you know different levels of you know your FSH, LH, and your progesterone, and all of that. Um, you can even have you guys ever heard of ferning? I know this was a thing until uh, my wife was trying to get pregnant. Basically, um, you, based on changes in the spit and the saliva, you have different crystallization of different salts and things. And so you can actually look at it through um, like a microscope, but a little, um, uh, magnifying lens, of it, basically. Uh, and you can see that based on the, the crystal pattern, that gives you an idea. Okay, now she's ovulating. It's like I feel like it's like looking at tea leaves or something, but um, not 100% effective. Uh, but it could be one other thing you may, may see being uh, recommended. Because again, you always want to know like what your patients are trying. Um, you know, oh yeah, I tried the ferning method and it didn't work. And like, okay, well at least you know what it is. You know. Okay, um, so menopause we mentioned is going to be that cessation of uh, activity of the ovarian, uh, uh, the ovaries and of menses. Uh, so you're going to be seeing uh, decreased levels of estradiol. Um, notice it does not decrease levels of FH and LSH because they don't have that negative feedback loop anymore. So those levels should remain somewhat high, uh, but estrogen levels should be uh, relatively low. And again, because you're never um, developing that follicle, you're never developing that corpus luteum, progesterone levels are going to be low as well. Okay. Usually occurs after age 50 or so, um, but it could depend on, on the patient. Uh, if you imagine, like, you know, if I had to give a patient uh, a hysterectomy, it could happen whenever that occurs, right? So some patients, especially if they have cancer or things, may have it happen earlier uh, due to removal of the ovaries. It just depends on, uh, or they have like ovarian cancer, it just depends on, on, on what the, the case may be. But usually around 50 or so, what will occur naturally. Call it the change, right? They always refer to it as. I've never heard of another medical condition, just call it the change. But anyway, um, so some of the symptoms we can see, we kind of mentioned these already, but things like hot flashes that occur, this is usually due to vasomotor disturbances. We have a lot of uh, these periods of uh, vasodilation, so you get very hot and get very flushed, uh, very uncomfortable, a lot of sweating goes along with that. Um, you'll see that the walls of the urethra, uh, urethra the, the vagina, they like to atrophy. Uh, things like vaginal glands don't really produce a lot of lubrication. So again, they can be very, very uncomfortable for your patient. Uh, it can make sex very difficult or, or very painful. Um, so we may uh, do things to help uh, replace that and get those uh, secretions going again. And then also when you lose uh, the, the effects of things like estrogen and progesterone, uh, you do have some increased risk for things like atherosclerosis, things like osteoporosis, because um, one thing that we do know is that estrogens have very positive effects on the bone. Uh, so increased estrogen activity helps to, to make sure we keep our bones nice and mineralized and, and prevents things like um, breaks and whatnot uh, from occurring later on. Um, also some risk for atherosclerosis. It's kind of interesting because uh, there's some studies that say, you know, not every woman needs to be on uh, hormone replacement therapy when they hit menopause. Um, there's possibly some increase in cardiovascular death, even though we think it kind of helps with atherosclerosis, even if they're deficient. So it's kind of a tightrope you're kind of walking there. Um, but essentially, um, we can uh, use certain drugs that can actually um, act as, you know, an antagonist of one type of tissue and act as an agonist in other types of tissue. So we'll talk about those when we get to, to farm. Um, but there's just some ways we can get around that. Um, some th things we can do in order to deal with individual symptoms is sometimes just give a local application of uh, things like estrogen. So if you ever see someone who's like on primarin cream or some sort of estrogen type cream, they can apply that actually locally, uh, directly in the vagina, and that can have local effects without getting a lot of the systemic activity. Uh, so that's one way we can actually limit some of those side effects that you may uh, see from giving um, systemic estrogens. Okay, so any questions on that? All right, so going into fertilization and pregnancy. Again, fertilization, uh, basically we mentioned that several hundred million sperm are getting uh, released uh, during ejaculation. Only about 100 of these actually live uh, to enter the fallopian tube, so not uh, very very often. Oftentimes uh, during ovulation, you'll start to see changes in the female reproductive tract where things like um, mucus secretion uh, is becoming more hospitable to the sperm that allows for uh, better uh, better travel for them. Uh, so they talk about this kind of like uh, thin kind of ropey uh, mucus that forms that it will allow for um, kind of better movement of the sperm up towards the fallopian tube, because again, that's where the, the fertilization process is primarily going to, to occur there. So I um, mentioned this occurs within the uterine tubes, usually in the ampullae. Uh, so once you have um, release of that mature ova from uh, that graphene follicle that's going to be released into the, uh, the fimbriae, uh, here is where you're going to notice that the fertilization process can actually uh, occur there. Um, so here you can see like the Michael Phelps of, of the, you know, the winter circle there. <laughs> anyway, you probably... Was a very good swimmer, right? So, um, 
I always think, you know, don't ever call yourself a loser because you're at least a winner once, you know? <laughs> hey. Um, so basically what's happening here is this, uh, that, remember the acrosome that was on uh, towards the head of, of the, the sperm? I mentioned there's like lots of um, kind of proteolytic enzymes and there's hyaluronidase and stuff like that. That's going to be really important here for this fusion uh, to actually uh, occur here. So basically we're having this association between the acrosome cap of the sperm and the zona pellucida, uh, this kind of outer uh, kind of granular uh, epithelia of the, the oocyte. It'll also stimulate things that injury like uh, calcium, uh, and then we're going to be releasing all those enzymes from that uh, the acrosome. So that allows for the sperm basically to digest that material, uh, to start to break it down, the connective tissue and whatnot, and allows for um, the, the actual fusion to occur and allows for the, the injection of that genetic material into the actual ova. So here you can see uh, the, you know, the nucleus of the, the cell, uh, the sperm, and there's the acrosome is going to contain all those enzymes, going to start to uh, release those, start to break down that zona uh, pellucida, uh, you know, get rid of some of these epithelial cells and this kind of tough tissue, uh, and then it's going to be able to fuse and allow for that, uh, the nucleus to, to enter, and now you're going to have a full complement of, of DNA at that point. Now remember, uh, this is uh, once this occurs, you still need to have uh, the the finishing stages of meiosis to occur uh, for the egg to actually be able to receive um, that genetic information or for the zygote to form, I guess. Um, so if you're looking here, uh, looking at the, the changes after fertilization. Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, I don't know why the whole thing doesn't go in, but it's not needed, so. Because once it says, hey, once they get that nucleus into the cell, we don't really, we don't need that tail anymore, right? So, for whatever reason. I mean, most of us lost our tails. We were fetuses anyway. Some of us may still have them. I don't know. I'm not ready to talk about that. Um, anyway. <laughs> So you can look at that primary oocyte, once you have uh, development, that, uh, getting rid of that first uh, polar body, right? That's kind of the first uh, division, the first meiotic division that happens here. You can get rid of that. Um, uh, you have the secondary oocyte. And then notice it's going to be, uh, once you have ovulation occur here, things are ready, uh, but you're still kind of um, halted at, at that metaphase two, right? So we're waiting for the implantation to occur. Um, once the fertilization actually happens, once you're getting that extra genetic information in there, you're going to notice that the uh, second polar body is informed off of that, right? So this is kind of the finishing of meiosis too. So now we have the haploid ova and the haploid sperm coming together and mix their genetic information. And now we have a zygote, right? Now they're ready for cell division, which becomes very, very rapid at this point, getting ready for implantation as it travels from the fallopian tube down into the uterus. <coughs> Just another picture kind of showing what's going on here. So again, you have a release of the ova during ovulation. You have the secondary oocyte. Now you have fertilization happening here. Um, we're going to have uh, mixing of the genetic uh, info. Uh, zygote is going to start to pull these apart, and then rapid uh, mitosis is going to occur here. So eventually, when you have a blastocyst, um, you know, certain cell numbers associated with these. But um, as you start to develop more and more of these cells, eventually get implanted to the sides of the uterus uh, and allow for um, uh, allow for you know, actual development of the fetus to occur. Actually, it's kind of interesting. One of the things that we ran into uh, probably took us about a year for my wife to get pregnant the the first time, right? So uh, one of the things we actually did is the the um, the reproductive endocrinologist was actually saying that you know you can actually have blockage of these fallopian tubes, which can sometimes make fertilization very difficult. And so one of the things they did is they actually can use contrast and apply it there and actually see um, basically based on the the radiograph, see you know where the flow is actually happening, see if one or, or both of those tubes are blocked. And so it was actually kind of interesting is that if you see that one's blocked, you can actually use that contrast and force it uh, uh, to actually kind of blow through whatever blockage is there and actually open up the fallopian tubes. And so some women they'll find that you know they uh, may have had trouble getting pregnant before, had that procedure done, and all of a sudden it's like super easy for them because they had that blockage that they just didn't know about um, that was there. So and again, that would prevent the sperm from getting up there, you know, implanting with the, the egg. Um, and so for some women, that, that is a problem with, uh, with conception. It's just kind of an interesting thing I never really heard of before uh, until you get involved with the whole pregnancy process. So anywho, uh, implantation is usually going to happen uh, on the sixth day after fertilization. Again, when you have ovulation occur, you have about a day or two uh, for that egg to really stay um, uh, stay viable. And again, depending on you know when uh, the sperm were kind of like uh, you know deposited into the, the uh, um, reproductive tract, you know they may stay viable for you know say four or five days or so. So again, it's hard to say you know specifically when sex last occurred versus when the actual um, fertilization happened there. But um, usually about six days or so afterwards, um, you see that blastocyst will end up implanting itself into the endometrium, um, and then it basically becomes completely buried here um, within the uterus. So again, you can kind of see the the daily the daily development of this as it occurs.
you'll see these trophoblastic cells, they start to, uh, to uh, invade the endometrium. They're starting to start to kind of break down this tissue because uh, it's very, very uh, highly uh, nutritious, lots of nutrients there. They can start to break down and incorporate as it starts to develop things like, you know, the amniotic cavity and then the placenta and all of that. Okay, um, also what you can see here, and this is another really important hormone once pregnancy has occurred, is, is human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. Um, this is oftentimes when you take a pregnancy test or um, you have a patient take a pregnancy test, this is usually what you're looking for. Um, you can either detect this in the blood or you can detect it in the urine in a lot of cases, uh, which is where you, you know, pee on a stick, and then you can determine if you have a, a HCG levels high enough to, to indicate pregnancy. Because really, you really shouldn't be producing any if you are uh, not currently pregnant. But um, basically what you'll end up seeing is that when you actually have... Um, uh, levels will start to elevate up, and what that does, it actually kept, keeps the corpus luteum alive and continuing to release estradiol uh, and progesterone, okay? So it actually prevents the menstruation from occurring. So if you were to have implantation but no HCG being produced, um, you still end up having a normal menses and, and end up sloughing off that tissue. So it's really, really important to keep that corpus luteum around during that initial phase. Now, uh, is the corpus luteum going to be predominantly producing progesterone and estrogen during the whole pregnancy? You'll see that's not the case. You'll actually see that the, um, the eventually the placenta is going to start to take over uh, as far as releasing a lot of estrogen. That's why I mentioned that the ovaries are primarily releasing estrogen in non-pregnant females. We'll see how that differs when uh, we have a pregnant female we're dealing with. But um, you can see that uh, secretion of HCG usually declines by about the 10th week or so. Um, and at that point, you don't really need to have the, the corpus luteum around anymore. And see so the placenta taking over hormonal production to, in order to maintain that, that pregnancy. So you can kind of see um, serum chorionic gonadotropin levels. You can see how uh, if you were to have a normal spike up here um, during the first few weeks. Uh, and again, as the levels get higher, you're able to, to detect that more easily on different tests. And then uh, once you get down to the 10th week or so, it starts to get back down uh, towards uh, pretty low levels, essentially. So early on, uh, during, if you're actually looking at the, the concentrations of um, hormones that are being made here, early on you're going to have the uh, the HCG levels are going to spike up, keeps the corpus luteum around, producing estrogen and progesterone. Uh, and then as the placenta starts to take over, uh, you notice the levels get very, very high here. Lots of interesting side effects that come about from having such high levels. Um, but this gets the body ready essentially to have, um, uh, get ready to you know, develop the fetus and get ready for, for birth nine months later. Okay, so again, just kind of showing you the uh, development of the fetus and seeing how the HCG levels are going to be spiking up and going down. And then uh, its placenta gets more and more uh, developed. It's going to be generating more and more estrogen and progesterone uh, straight through to the third trimester. The levels can be very, very high here um, towards the end. If you're looking at actual levels of HCG, kind of what's average uh, for these uh, patients uh, during their different weeks of pregnancy, notice here that levels are pretty low. Could be difficult to detect um, early on, but now once you start to get, you know, kind of a little bit further on, um, trying to keep that corpus luteum around, you're going to notice the levels are going to spike up pretty, pretty high. Uh, here is, you know, if you order like a urine drug screen, um, you know, usually you're just checking for presence, yes or no. If the HCG is there, usually with like a blood test, you can actually get a better idea of like uh, quality quantitatively how much is sticking around. Um, but again, once you detect it, it's usually a pretty uh, good idea. Yeah, your patient's pregnant. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the amniotic sac and the placenta. I think I'm actually going to cut it there. Uh, we'll come back and, and finish this um, uh, tomorrow along with the last lecture. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so essentially what you're seeing is that the developing uh, blastocyte, and once it gets kind of implanted there in the uterus, it's going to start to uh, produce HCG. And so normally, uh, if you were to take a normal urine pregnancy test, like notice there's always two lines. You guys know what the, the first line's for? Yes, the, the control line, right? So as long as that first line lights up, that usually means that the test is, is working, right? So essentially, it's not reacting with HCG. It just shows that, hey, the, the actual test is working. I'm sure you'll learn more about that in your uh, clinical lab class, I imagine. Um, but uh, basically, when you have the second line is when it pops up, that usually means that, hey, um, the uh, the assay has worked where the you know the specific color change that occurs due to um, you know, antibody binding to, to the HCG. Once that happens there, that, that's when the color change actually happens. So um, one of the things is that um, some people think, like, well, how... How dark was the line? Like how much color change actually occurred? It doesn't matter how much color change happens. All that matters is, is there, do you see a line? Yes or no? If yes, then you're pregnant, right? Because um, again, it's, it's not really meant to be a, a, a quantitative test. It's a qualitative test, yes or no kind of thing. So uh, any other questions? All right, so we will finish this up tomorrow and I'll see you guys then. <coughs>